Good afternoon, everybody. Brian Newbert here from GoldenBlack.com. This is kind of what you've all been waiting for the last couple weeks. You know, there's been a lot of excitement in the air. Kids are off school, getting out of bed early when they're home uh, because they're so wound up with excitement over this big event that happens uh, this time of year. Obviously talking about um, Purdue's non-conference finale against Central Michigan. Played at noon in Mack Arena on a Saturday afternoon. What could be more exciting uh, than this? I'll be damned if I have an answer to that question. But um, this is your real holiday present, your rap video uh, following Purdue's 97-62 to win over the Chippewas of Central Michigan. Um, came in here third nationally in scoring. Um, a number grossly, grossly skewed by level of competition, uh, of course. You read our pregame, our preview, our pregame thoughts, whatever it might be. Um, they played Trinity Christian, Michigan Dearborn, and something called Siena Heights, which is, I believe, a uh, either a, a Crayola crayon color or a uh, primetime soap opera, one or the other. Um, not to mention Mississippi Valley State, who's the worst team in the country, according to uh, our good friend uh, Ken Pomeroy. Anyway. Um, where, where, where am I going with this? I have no idea. Um, you know, Purdue's had some offensive challenges this season, obviously, and I think the most important thing to make crystal clear after a game like this is these sorts of games distort reality the same way that Central Michigan's schedule distorts reality. Um, nothing that could have happened today would have represented any of Purdue's ills being healed. Um resolved, whatever uh, term you want to use. Uh, but Purdue has had offensive challenges this year. And in that sense, uh, you know, this was probably about as good as you could have hoped for um, in the context of those, those issues. The missed layups, the missed transition stuff, whatever it might be, uh, was held to a minimum, which is always positive. Uh, Purdue shot 52% from the floor, 53%. You have to round up the eight. 53%? Uh, no, that's the first half. 54%? That's even better. No, wait, 54.5%. That's the best number I, of all of those I could have chosen from. 54% shooting, obviously, is very good. Um, this is not a good defensive team they played. But, you know, Purdue's been an inconsistent shooting team um, all season long. They've been way better at home than they've been away from home, which obviously is a trend you'd like to break if you're going to win the sorts of games uh, that you might need to win uh, to compete in the Big Ten or get in the NCAA tournament, whatever situation you might find yourself in, Purdue's going to have to find a way to make shots away from Mackey Arena. But given your choice between making shots and not making shots, you take making shots nine times out of ten at least. And Purdue was given that choice today, and they they chose to make shots, um, which was a positive development. Sasha Stefanovic is becoming that guy, if he wasn't already, who can you know make three in a row, make four in a row, make four to five, four to six, whatever it might be, change a game uh, in the span of a couple of minutes. Uh, it wasn't a span in this game. He was good from start to finish, um, making seven of ten, scoring 23 points. My point about him being that you know this has been a very inconsistent shooting team. Some guys I think Purdue has needed to make jump shots this season have been very uh, up and down. Uh, Aaron Wheeler's obviously struggled to make threes all season long. Jahad Proctor's not shooting the ball particularly well. Eric Hunter's really come on lately. Um, but Sasha Stefanovic is kind of that guy who's been at worst steady all along. And uh, But he has had these outbursts, Texas, Virginia, and now today uh, in, on a much lesser uh, stage in those first two games, that was that, that's a big deal for this team. For a team that can struggle to score, to have a guy who can come in and kind of change the complexion of a game, that's always a, a really, really positive thing to have. And Stefanovic was was really, really good in this game beyond just making damn near every shot he took. Um, he was really good, played a good floor game, just played well. Uh, and I think Purdue offensively got both big guys involved. Uh, both were really efficient, unlike the last we saw of both of them that being Matt Harms, one of seven on two-point field goals at Nebraska before sustaining the concussion, and Travion Williams being, I believe, four of 13, either total or on two-point field goals. Um, against Butler, I can't remember which one was which. He made a three at the buzzer, uh, which I try not to count into it how he in, in assessing how he played because it didn't really matter. Um, but the last time those guys each played, 
they were uncommonly, uncharacteristically inefficient from the floor. Both of those guys were good today. Obviously, this was the path of least resistance from a defensive perspective. Offensively, um, you know, I jokingly asked in the press conference, anybody who has a profound thought on this, feel free to answer. And I was just being an idiot. And um, I actually got a profound answer, uh, which was uh, the best you could ask for. Um, all that, remember, all that matters is the answer. The question doesn't matter. But I asked about, um, you know, they're switching defenses and what that meant from a final exam a test perspective. And Matt Harms gave a really good answer. And Matt Harms is a press conference All-America for Purdue. In my time covering Purdue, he is on that Mount Rushmore. Um, who the others would be, I'd have to put some thought into that. But he for sure uh, is on that um, Purdue Mount Rushmore of press conference presences. Um, and he gave a really good, really in-depth, really thought-out answer that was, was really added some important context to this game that Purdue, they were switching, they were doing everything defensively and they were switching defenses constantly. And, you know, my one defining memory of teams that switched defenses constantly was back when Tom Crean was at Indiana and they weren't very good defensively. Um, you know, they had a lot of instances where like half their team was playing zone and the other half, and I know there's five guys on the floor, so you can't have half. Um, half of them were playing man, whatever it might be. It was a big part of their problem defensively, it seemed like, back in the day. And if you remember John Octis' dunk on Colin Hartman, there is a there is legal action that could have been taken on Colin Hartman's behalf, I think, against Troy Williams, because Troy Williams was playing zone when the other four guys were playing man. And that's what allowed John Octis to go in and do those terrible, terrible things that he did to Colin Hartman on that day. I know Purdue fans still talk about it. It was one of the really, really memorable individual plays um, of the last few years for Purdue, and it was solely attributable to the fact that Troy Williams had no idea what defense Indiana was playing. I bring that up because hearing Harms tell it, it kind of dawned on me that it's probably what happened a lot here today is that you know Purdue attacked a defense before everybody on the floor knew what defense they were in, and Purdue got a lot of easy stuff off it, I'm sure. Uh, I thought Purdue was just being aggressive, trying to go quick to try to uh, just be aggressive, basically. But there was some method to the madness, it seems like. And that probably had a lot to do with 54% shooting. Purdue was getting good high percentage stuff real quick. Uh, a lot of uncontested stuff, a lot of open threes. Um, just a really good offensive performance. Again, that needs to be couched in the fact that this is not a good defensive team they played. Um, throw some confusion into that and you take a team that's not very good defensively and it, it, it warps reality even more. Uh, but the other part of this too is that, you know, regardless of who they played, Central Michigan came in here averaging almost 89 points a game. They play in a way, tempo-wise, uh, that lends itself to scoring a lot of points and Purdue still only holds them to 61 points. I think they had 12, uh, 13 minutes into the game, which obviously decided the game. Um, so just a good all-around performance by Purdue as should have been expected in a game like this. Um, Purdue made its layups, made its putbacks. Uh, that's where improvement kind of has to lie. From here, more than anything else, Purdue has to take advantage of the opportunities. It, when it plays well, it affords itself. Um, but as Painter said in the press conference, you also have to play well when you're not having a magical shooting night on your home floor. But I thought Purdue was really good defensively. Uh, you know, I thought you really missed Matt Harms against Butler, probably more on defense than on offense, so you could have used him on offense as well. But I thought as soon as he came in, you know, he blocks a shot, he gets a steal. He gets a steal because he, he seals off a lane as a seven foot three guy who moves his feet really well that might have been open had a guy of his proportion of and his mobility not been there uh, to close it off. So you, you really feel his impact uh, from a defensive perspective, and it was really good for Purdue to have him back, obviously. I think Nogel Eastern did some really positive things defensively. If you're one of those people who can't handle positive developments for Nogel Eastern being pointed out, I can't help you. If you're that mad, if you're that rid riddled with angst over this player, um, and you're going to get really mad when I point out that he forced at least three or four turnovers in the first half, Stop watching right now because I can't help you. I have to point that stuff out. It matters. Um, also made two free throws, by the way. So if you need to go scream into a pillow um, in the other room, by all means, go ahead. Anyway, I thought that, uh, you know, Nojel Eastern was really good defensively. I thought uh, pretty much everybody was pretty good 
from a defensive perspective. Uh, Purdue's a pretty good defensive team, uh, especially now that they have Harms back. That's going to be its path. Uh, this is never going to be, you know, the offensive teams Purdue's had the last couple of years, I don't think. I don't think they're going to be able to beat people with offense um, solely. I think this they have to get back to their model from earlier this season now that they have harms back where it's a matter of you win with defense, you win with rebounding, and you just don't beat yourself offensively. You cobble together enough offense, you get the ball to your big men a lot, and you just do enough offensively to win the game, 65 to um, 58, whatever it might be. It would be great to be able to get to 72, 73, 75 points every night. You just don't know if that's going to be reality for this team. They are capable of making jump shots. They are capable of playing inside out through some really good big men. They've just not done a whole lot from a consistency perspective against good people uh, to really send you into Big Ten play thinking this is what they are, this is what they can be, this is how this season's going to play out. Nothing is guaranteed from here on out for Purdue in Big Ten play. Obviously, you've already lost to the worst team in the league. Um, but, you know, I, I, don't, I think this is a little bit of a different year in the sense that I know Purdue has – Purdue is viewed as one of those top three, top four in the Big Ten prior to this season. I think they could finish anywhere from there to the middle of the pack, if not the bottom of the middle of the pack, uh, so to speak. I think there's a wide range of possibilities for this team. This team is not assured of a place in the NCAA tournament. They have to get a lot better than they've been in non-conference play. Obviously, they've tested themselves well or been tested well by a pretty good non-conference schedule. That should make them better. That should give them some benefit of the doubt on Selection Sunday. They will be rewarded. Uh, for at least playing a difficult schedule. But you do need the wins to go along with it, and Purdue exits non-conference play, wishing it had a couple more of those wins, obviously, uh, to put themselves in a bit of a better position. You're already behind the eight ball uh, from a Big Ten race perspective, and you've incurred a bad loss during this portion of the season in December because you lost to Nebraska, a game you should have won. There was no reason uh, to lose that game. Uh, that's going to haunt Purdue. No going back now. Purdue just has to get better. It has to win a bunch of games in the Big Ten uh, to get in the NCAA tournament, and we'll kind of see where they are at the end to see if they have a chance to uh, you know, be in that upper echelon in the Big Ten again. That's kind of become the expectation around here. This is a bit of a different year, though, so we'll kind of see where they go from here. But um, that's the non-conference season. I don't know what your favorite memory was. Um, mine was walking back to a pitch black parking lot outside of Northwest Florida State Community College at 1 o'clock in the morning, wondering what would happen if I were a more vulnerable individual walking through this parking lot this late at night and there was trouble lurking in those trees. Um, that and the debacle getting back from Nebraska to Ohio. That's my. Those are my holiday grievances. Um, so... Feel free to share your holiday grievances on our message boards, uh, whatever you want to do. Uh, it's pretty much 24-hour grievance airing. Um, so we'll uh, talk to you again on January 2nd following Purdue's, what do we call it, the resumption of Big Ten play January 2nd when Minnesota visits Mack Arena. For the time being, this has been Brian Newbert from GoldenBlack.com following Purdue's 97-62 win over Central Michigan. Thank you for watching. Thank you for reading. Thank you for listening. Thank you for processing our materials, however it is you process our materials, and please be safe on New Year's, everyone. PSA, I'm here to look out for you. Thank you.